By most people's standards, Susan Monica's life had been pretty good. She had a small but very close group of friends, she had a great job working as an engineer, and she lived in one of the most exciting cities in the world, San Francisco, California. But Susan was not happy. Moving to the big city was not so much a choice as it was a product of life and circumstance. Deep down, Susan had always been someone who preferred peace and quiet and being alone, things that were in rare supply in a big city like San Francisco. Many nights after work, Susan would come home to her apartment and she would sit there and dream about moving away from the city and living off the grid somewhere on a farm, you know, raise her own food and be totally self-sufficient away from everybody else in the world. And then one day in 1991, when Susan was 43 years old, she made that dream a reality. That year, she wound up purchasing a 20-acre farm located in a forest in a little town in Oregon called Weimar. However, this farm was really not a farm. There was nothing on it. There was no house for Susan to live in. There was no barn for her animals or tools. There was no running water, no electricity, no septic system. It was just pure Oregonian wilderness. But to Susan, it was perfect. The property kept her far away from other people, and she liked the idea of having to literally build her own farm. After all, she was an engineer by trade, so she actually knew how to build buildings efficiently and safely, and she was a big, strong, sturdy woman who was not afraid of manual labor. So when Susan finally arrived in Weimar and made her way up the winding dirt road through the forest and arrived in front of her property and looked out at the vast, rugged landscape for the first time, she was filled with a rush of excitement. Even though there was nothing on her 20 acres, it already felt like home. Over the next several months, Susan would transform these 20 acres into a neat little farm, complete with a big barn and a shack for her to live in and a few animal pens for livestock. However, after the farm was built, Susan realized that building the farm was actually not the hard part. The hard part was maintaining the farm, going out there every day and doing all of her chores, feeding all the animals and doing all the different projects she had in mind. It was exhausting. And so not long after the farm was complete, Susan realized that as much as she wanted to be totally alone out there, she had to set that aside and hire some help. And so Susan printed out all of these help wanted flyers and put them all over town in Weimar. And before long, people began making their way up to her property to inquire about the role. Most of these applicants were people who struggled to find work elsewhere, either because they lived a sort of transient lifestyle, bouncing around from place to place so no one was ready to hire them long term, or because they had a criminal record and just straight up could not get a job. But Susan didn't care about either of those things. All she cared about was the people she hired would work hard and they would respect the peaceful, calm atmosphere she was fostering on her farm. Basically, do the work and leave me alone. And over the next 20 years, Susan would find dozens of people who were able to do just that. Most of them would work for Susan only for a short period of time. Others would stick around for a little bit longer, but eventually all of Susan's workers kind of rotated pretty quickly and moved on to other things. And when that happened, Susan would simply put up more help wanted flyers in town and hire more people. And in all the 20 years that Susan had been hiring these temporary workers at her farm, after they did move on and went somewhere else, Susan never heard about them again. However, that was about to change. On January 1st, 2014, Susan, who was 66 years old by this point, was outside of her shack out on her driveway when she happened to look up and see a car coming up her road. Now remember, she lives in the middle of nowhere. No one comes out to see her, so this is a very rare event. And so Susan is totally keyed in on this car. And this car, they pull into her driveway and then out of the car pop three young people. It was two young men and one young woman. And before Susan could even ask them who they were or why they were here, they were telling her. They said they were looking for their father, Robert Haney, who at one point had told them he was working on Susan's farm in exchange for a little cash. And also Susan was letting him park his camper on her property and he was living in that camper. The kids said their father always checked in with them at least once every couple of months, but they had just gone this really long stretch without hearing from him. And since he didn't have a cell phone and no permanent address, they had no real way of getting in touch with him. And so they were out there looking for him to make sure he was okay. And so they asked Susan, do you remember our dad, Robert? And if so, do you know where he is? 
even though this whole situation was totally surprising for Susan because she almost never got visitors, so that alone was kind of jarring for her. But when she heard the kids say their dad's name, Robert Haney, she immediately knew who that was. Susan told them that she had hired their father the previous spring to help build a structure on her farm, and initially, Robert was really nice to have around the farm. He worked really hard, he kept to himself, he was quiet, and he had a dog that was really friendly and loving. But in August of the previous year, so five months into Robert's employment on Susan's farm, Susan would tell them that their dad totally changed. He started drinking really heavily and not really working very much and spending a lot of the day just kind of ranting and raving outside of his camper about how he wanted to exact his revenge on someone. Susan would eventually find out that what Robert was talking about is apparently one of his kids had been assaulted and he felt very guilty that he had not been there to protect his child. And so the way Robert was handling this guilt was by drinking and thinking about getting his revenge on the attacker. Now, while Susan did understand why Robert felt the way he did and why he was kind of acting the way he was, it didn't change the fact that Robert's behavior had become very disruptive on her farm and the one thing Susan really wanted was peace and quiet. And so she decided she would have to go confront Robert about his behavior and potentially fire him if he couldn't find a way to calm down. But before Susan ever had to do that, Robert one day just walked right up to her shack. He handed her an envelope filled with cash and he asked Susan if she wouldn't mind looking after his dog for a while. And Susan was so taken aback by his complete change in behavior and this request that she just took the envelope and said, okay, I'll look after your dog. And then Robert nodded his thank you. He turned around and he walked away from her. And then a few moments later, Susan's standing there with the envelope in hand, watching as Robert is climbing into some white car that had just pulled up in front of the property. She didn't know who was in the car with him. And then the car turned around and drove out of sight. Susan told the kids that that had happened back in September, so about four months ago. And since he left, she had not heard from him, despite the fact she still had his dog. And she told the kids that a lot of Robert's stuff was still in his camper. Susan brought the kids over to the side of her property where Robert's camper was, and when they went inside, sure enough, all their father's things were all over the place, but the one item that immediately stood out to them was their father's tool belt. They knew their father was a traveling handyman, that was how he made his living, and so it begged the question, why would he leave his tool belt here if he knew he was going to be gone for several months potentially? It didn't make any sense. After leaving Robert's camper, the kids thanked Susan and asked her to please be in touch if she learned anything else about their dad, and she said she would. And then the kids got back in their car and they began driving south towards the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. When they got there, they asked to file a missing person report for their dad. However, they learned very quickly that it was going to be very challenging to locate their dad because their dad lived this transient lifestyle with no cell phone, he had no permanent address, he had nothing that could really be traced. But the investigators agreed with Robert's children that their dad's absence was a big concern given the fact that his last interactions with Susan had consisted of him drinking very heavily and talking about going and getting his revenge on his child's attacker. And so the sheriff and the deputies were very concerned that that was exactly what Robert had done. He had gone out and potentially murdered someone and now was in hiding. So they asked Robert's kids if they could think of absolutely anything that could possibly allow investigators to track down Robert. And at some point, one of the kids said, oh, what about my dad's EBT card? EBT cards, or electronic benefit transfer cards, are like debit cards for state welfare services. You can use the cards to buy things like groceries, and the cards are definitely traceable. A few days later, when Robert's EBT card trace came back, investigators saw the card had been used just one month earlier in a Walmart located about 30 minutes southwest of Susan's farm. Now, this trace obviously didn't tell investigators where Robert was right now or what kind of condition Robert was in, but they had no other leads to operate on, so they decided they would go to the Walmart and see what they could find. When they got there, the investigators were led to the back room of the building where they were able to review the security footage from the previous month when Robert was supposedly there with his EBT card. But after reviewing hours and hours and hours of footage, the investigators never saw Robert on camera. 
However, they did see Susan on camera, and unbelievably, she was the one using Robert's EBT card. And so obviously, this was very suspicious, and right away, the investigators left the Walmart, went back to their office, and began the process of getting a search warrant to search Susan's farm. A few days later, on January 10th, the sheriff and his deputies arrived at Susan's property, and when they pulled onto her driveway, Susan came outside to greet them. When she asked them, you know, what's going on, they told her, hey, we're here to search your property in connection with Robert Haney's disappearance. And before Susan could ask any more questions, the sheriff said to her, hold on, just turn around, let's go back inside, I need to talk to you privately. And so Susan, who was very shocked by this, just said, okay, and she turned around and led the sheriff into her house while the other deputies fanned out across the property to begin this big search. Once inside of Susan's house, they sat down in her kitchen, and right away, the sheriff says to Susan, okay, I have you on camera using Robert's EBT card. I know you stole it, so you need to tell me where Robert is right now, or it's gonna get a whole lot worse for you. And as soon as he said this, Susan's look of shock on her face quickly turned into a look of kind of relief. It was like suddenly she understood what was going on here. And she says to the sheriff, no, I didn't steal his EBT card. He gave it to me along with an envelope full of cash when he left four months ago. And he told me to use it to buy dog food for his dog that I'm looking after. And since Robert had been gone for all these months, she had run out of cash to pay for the dog food and now was using the EBT card. Susan also added that if she had just stolen the card from Robert, she wouldn't be able to use it because it requires a PIN number, and Robert gave her the PIN number. That's how she was able to use it. The sheriff was not totally sold on Susan's story, and so he continued to ask more questions, trying to trip Susan up about how she came to acquire this card, but Susan was very firm that Robert had given her the card, and that was it. And so after several minutes, the sheriff realized that Susan was likely telling the truth, which meant the EBT card angle was likely a dead end and they would have to call off the search. But as the sheriff was standing up to leave the kitchen and leave the property altogether, a deputy from outside came running into the kitchen and without saying a word, just bent down and whispered something into the sheriff's ear. And as the sheriff is listening to this deputy, his face is contorting in disgust. He can't believe what he's being told. And after the deputy stands up and leaves the kitchen, the sheriff takes a deep breath and then looks at Susan and says, ma'am, you're gonna have to come with us. Back at the station, a now very flustered Susan was led into a small interrogation room where she sat down looking totally anxious. She's looking around, wondering what's going on. And then the sheriff walked into the room, immediately hit record on the camera, and then looked at Susan and says, has anyone died on your property? The story that Susan would tell the sheriff that day in the interrogation room was so completely unexpected and horrific, it would make headlines all across the country. Before Susan began this story, she told the sheriff that everything she had said about Robert Haney's disappearance had been the truth. However, she had left one little detail out. After Robert had handed Susan that envelope full of cash and the EBT card, and then climbed into that stranger's car and driven away, after that, Robert had actually come back to her farm and recently. Susan said she discovered his return when one morning she got up and she went outside to go feed her animals when she looked over at the pig pen and saw all the pigs who would normally be laying down and lounging around at that time of the day. They were all up and they had converged in one portion of the pig pen and they had kind of formed a circle around something on the ground as if they were all trying to look at something on the ground. Now, Susan said this was totally uncharacteristic, so obviously something weird was going on, and so Susan dropped her food and rushed over to the fence. She climbed into the pig pen, and as she got closer and closer to all these pigs, she realized they weren't just looking at something on the ground, they were eating something on the ground. And so Susan goes right up to this ring of pigs, and she begins pulling them aside, and then right in the middle on the ground, 
is Robert. He was laying on his back and his insides had all been torn out. It was like the pigs were disemboweling him. And the most shocking thing is Robert was still alive. He was moving his arm and groaning. Susan tried to pull the pigs off of Robert, but she said they kept coming back and really aggressively continued to eat Robert. It was like they were in this feeding frenzy. And so Susan said, you know, I thought about lifting him up and moving him, but Robert was practically split in two. And she felt like if she tried to move him, that would kill him anyways. And so Susan said she did the thing that she thought was right at the time. She left the pig pen, went into the barn, got a shotgun, ran back to the pig pen, raised the weapon, and fired it into Robert. Susan told the sheriff that this was purely an act of mercy. She was ending his suffering. After Robert was dead, Susan said she just left the pig pen, and then three days later, she went back into the pig pen with bags and collected the little bits of Robert that had not been eaten by her pigs. And then she took those bags of remains and chucked them into her barn on top of the trash pile. But clearly, Robert's remains had not remained in the barn because the thing that deputy had whispered into the sheriff's ear when the sheriff was talking to Susan in the kitchen was, Sir, we found a leg outside. It was Robert's leg, and it was found not inside of the barn in the trash pile, but out in the middle of her property, just out in the open. Susan, when confronted with that information, suggested that, you know, maybe a wild animal had gone into the barn, got a hold of it, and dragged it off. The sheriff didn't even know what follow-up questions to ask, and so he just said, well, why didn't you call 911 when you first saw Robert? I mean, maybe we could have saved him. Or at least, after he was dead, why didn't you tell someone? Susan would say that the reason she didn't tell anyone is she was afraid that if word got out about what her pigs had done, then her pigs would be euthanized and she would lose a major revenue stream because she sold her pigs meat in town. And she said even if her pigs were not euthanized, she was worried people in town would not want to buy her pigs meat after they learned her pigs were attacking and eating humans. Susan would tell the sheriff exactly where they could find the bags that contained Robert's remains, and she even said she would take a polygraph test to show she was now telling the whole truth. But when she actually sat down to take the polygraph test, she kept fidgeting and coughing and doing these really dramatic sighs, and it was causing the test operator to get really inaccurate readings. And so when this first polygraph test was over, the results were inconclusive. And so the investigators made Susan take another test, but again, she continued to fidget and yawn. And so finally, the investigators in the room watching this happen just called off the test. And when they did, they said to Susan, you know, hey, we're gonna search your farm and if there is anything on your farm that you have not told us about, you're going to be in serious trouble because we're going to find it. At this point, Susan kind of stopped fidgeting and she looked up at the investigators. And after a long pause, she reached out across the table and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen. She pulled it back and she began drawing something. And after a few seconds, it became pretty clear she was drawing a map of her farm. And after the map was all drawn out, she drew a big X in the middle of it and then slid the map back across the table to the investigators. And she said, if you go to that X, you'll find Steven. And the investigators are like, who's Steven? We're talking about Robert. What are you talking about? Well, it would turn out Robert was not the only farmhand to die on Susan's property. In 2012, about a year before Susan hired Robert, she hired another man named Stephen Delacino. And according to Susan, Stephen was a lot like Robert. He was really easy to get along with, he was quiet, he worked hard. But at some point, Susan said they had a big falling out. Susan said she started to suspect that Stephen was stealing her guns in her barn, and so she went to confront him. And during this confrontation, they got into this big fight, and Susan said she didn't really remember all the details of what happened next, but at some point during this fight, a gun went off, and then Stephen fell to the ground in the middle of the pig pen with his head bleeding, and all of Susan's pigs suddenly swarmed him and began eating him. The stunned investigators again asked Susan, okay, if that really happened the way you said it did, why didn't you call 911 if this was like an accident? And Susan would say, again, that her big fear was her pigs would either be euthanized 
or word would get out that her pigs were eating people, and the people in town would not want to buy her pig's meat because of that. In the end, as far-fetched as Susan's stories were about what happened to Robert Haney and Stephen Delacino, there was never any evidence that actually contradicted her claims. And so as a result, when Susan went on trial for murdering Robert and Stephen, it came down to whether or not the jury believed Susan. And they didn't. Not at all. They believed that Susan was completely lying, and that in reality, Susan, who was known to have a very quick temper, shot Stephen and shot Robert very much on purpose, and then threw them into her pig pen. We can only hope they were dead before her pigs began eating them. On April 21st, 2015, more than a year after Robert's children had reported him missing, Susan was convicted of two counts of murder for Robert and for Stephen, and two counts of abusing a corpse. She was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. While in custody, Susan would be overheard saying there were 17 other bodies buried on her property. However, when the police went out there and searched again very extensively, they never found any other remains. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the like button a cup of coffee, but be sure it's full of coffee grounds. On September 27th, 2018, in a little city in the Netherlands, a security camera captured six men walking calmly toward this brick bungalow inside one of the country's holiday parks. A holiday park is a place that offers cheap accommodations to tourists. They typically have things like campsites, RV parking, cheap bungalows for rent, and they also often offer things like swimming and golfing and bowling, so it's kind of like an all-in-one for families on vacation. But on this September day, these six men caught on camera were neither family nor on vacation. Instead, as they walked, it was very clear from their body language that the only thing they were interested in was getting inside of their holiday bungalow. Once they did reach the front door of this bungalow, the apparent leader of the group, who had dark brown hair and a full beard, he pulled out a key, unlocked the door, he opened it up, and then he made sure the rest of the men took off their shoes before walking inside. And then once all the men were inside the door, the leader shut the door and locked it behind them, and then barefoot, they walked through the hallway into this corner living room in the back of the bungalow. And in this room, there was this L-shaped couch that was centered on a coffee table and a couple of chairs scattered throughout the rest of the room and so the six men kind of took up seats in these different places and then after they were all sitting down two of the men who had been seen walking into the bungalow carrying backpacks and duffel bags they pulled those bags out and set them on the coffee table and as soon as these two men did that the other four men who had been chatting amongst themselves went completely silent and turned and just faced the bags on the table it was very clear that whatever was in the bags was very significant so significant in fact Act, that the group had pulled most of the curtains across all of the windows inside of this bungalow to make sure no one outside could look in and potentially see the contents of these bags. And once the two men unzipped the duffel bags and backpack and began putting the contents of the bags onto the table, it became incredibly clear why the men were so on edge. Inside of these bags were guns, and in the Netherlands, no private citizen is allowed to possess them. Over the next hour, the two men who had actually carried the guns into the bungalow, they began going over some instruction with the other four men of how to use these slick black pistols and AK-47 rifles. They taught them how to load the guns and reload and how to aim, and they did a number of dry firing exercises, which is basically pulling the trigger on any real gun when the gun is not loaded. And so these four students students paid careful attention to their two instructors and at some point they became more confident and you could just see the excitement was building in the room. At one point one of the students grabbed two of the AK-47 rifles and held one in each arm and pretended to fire them simultaneously like you would see in the Rambo movies. But when one of the two instructors reached back into one of these bags and pulled out a new item, a vest, and laid it on the coffee table, immediately the mood in the room shifted again. Now the students seemed more nervous than excited. 
One of the four students eventually walked forward and somewhat reluctantly extended his arm to allow the instructor to slip the vest onto him. And then once the vest was put on the student, you can see in the camera footage, there are pockets all over this vest with little wires poking out of them. This vest was a suicide vest and the pockets contained explosives. As one of the instructors showed the student in the vest, which cord to pull in order to detonate himself, you can hear in the background someone saying, when the police come, you can take them with you. A little over two hours later, these six men were done and they began packing up their arsenal of new weapons back into the bags and then they stood up to leave. But when they left, it was the students who had the bags of weapons, not the two instructors. Once the six men had left the bungalow and were back outside again, they put their shoes back on, they locked the bungalow behind them, and then the two instructors were seen on camera walking away from the bungalow to a separate car, they drove off, and then the four men that now had the weapons, they walked to a nearby white cargo van, which contained one other man who had not been inside of the bungalow with them, but he was very much a part of this group. He was their driver. And so as the four men with guns approached the white van, the driver saw them, he climbed out, he ran around to the back and opened up the back doors that led into the windowless back cargo area of the van. And the four men with guns, they climbed inside, the driver shut the van, climbed back into the driver's seat. And then before long, the driver was leaving the parking lot and heading north towards the city of Amsterdam, which is the capital of the Netherlands. Every year, Amsterdam plays host to one of the largest gay pride parades and events in the world. The location is significant to the LGBTQ community because it was here in 2001 that the first gay marriage bill was signed into law, making the Netherlands the first country in the world to legalize gay marriage. So for one week a year, hundreds of thousands of people pour out onto the streets and line the canals of Amsterdam, all drawn together to affirm gay rights and to celebrate their sexual expression, preference, and identity and the men in the white windowless van intended to use their new weapons and training to kill or maim as many parade goers as possible. They were hopeful that their terrorist attack would rival or even eclipse the attack from 2015 in Paris in a nightclub that killed or injured more than 500 people and sent shockwaves through Europe. 30 minutes later, the four men in the back of this windowless van felt the van slow down and pull off the main road and not come to a complete stop, but just kind of begin to slow roll, which was odd because they had no reason to slow down and they were at least 30 minutes away from their destination. And so instinctively, the men reach down and make sure their guns are safely stowed inside of their bags and out of sight in case somebody opens the back door. They don't want people to know they have guns, they are illegal. And so as the van continued to go painfully painfully slowly for really no reason that was clear, the men in the back of the van were really starting to worry that something was wrong. Now remember, they have no windows. They can't look outside. They don't know what's going on. However, there was a small crack in the partition that separated the back of the van from the front of the van where the driver was. And so the men in the back of the van began craning their necks and looking through this little crack to try to see if they could understand what was in front of the van and you know why the driver had stopped. And when these men looked through that little crack and they saw what was out there, they immediately began to panic. They began reaching down and fumbling for their bags, trying to open them up to get their guns. And then by the time they're kind of getting the guns into their hands, all the doors on the van fly open and the men in the back just begin firing their guns blindly at the open doors. But when they pull their triggers, nothing happens because their guns were fake. They had been sold to them by the people who were flinging open their doors, the police in tactical gear with their dogs, and they knew these guys had fake guns. They knew their suicide vests were fake. They were full of fake explosives. They have nothing lethal inside of this van. And so the police, they just fling the doors open and send in the dogs. And so the dogs, they jump into this van and these wannabe terrorists are screaming and they're firing their fake guns at the dogs as the dogs are shredding these terrorists to bits and then whenever they tried to jump out the police would just pistol whip the terrorists until finally all of these wannabe terrorists were in the fetal position crying or they were crouched down with their hands over their head. It would turn out the two instructors who had brought the duffel bags of guns into the bungalow with the other men, they were not other fellow terrorists. They were undercover police officers who were a part of the special national anti-terrorism team who were able to infiltrate this terrorist 
terrorist cell. These undercover cops were the ones who sold the fake guns and fake explosives to the terrorists, and they were the ones who set up this meeting at the bungalow, which allowed them to place cameras and listening devices all over the place. Plus, they were also able to bug the white van because they knew they would be departing the bungalow inside of it. So all the wannabe terrorists that you saw on camera, plus two others that were not seen on camera but were totally involved, were all sentenced on October 8th, 2020 to anywhere from 10 to 17 years in prison. Meanwhile, the Amsterdam Pride Parade went off without a hitch. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please replace all of the Pop-Tarts in the Like Button's pantry with the unfrosted kind. On July 19th, 2013, 49-year-old Matt Dyer climbed on board a tiny 19-seat Twin Otter airplane that was parked on the tarmac of the Montreal International Airport in Canada. Matt was about to take off on the first of two flights that would take him and seven other adventurous people deep into one of the most remote and wild regions in North America. For Matt, this trip was going to be the most amazing journey of his life. He had seen the ad for this two-week-long expedition about a year earlier when he was looking through a magazine put out by an environmental organization called the Sierra Club. Now, even though Matt was a lawyer, he didn't make much money. He lived in this tiny town in central Maine where he made a living by offering either free or very low-cost legal assistance for some of the state's poorest residents. But Matt was an avid outdoorsman, and when he saw the opportunity to explore one of Canada's newest national parks, that was so far north it was practically in the Arctic Circle, he decided the hefty $6,000 price tag was well worth it. Two and a half hours later, after flying over 900 miles due north away from the airport in Montreal, the Twin Otter airplane that Matt and the others were riding on touched down on a narrow gravel landing strip situated between this huge forest on a mountainside and a river on the other side. After climbing off the plane with all of their equipment, Matt and the seven others hustled their way over to this stretch of flimsy plywood buildings that lined the runway. These buildings and this entire area they were in was was not a part of this new national park they were going to. This was like their staging area to prepare and get ready before catching another flight that would bring them into the park. And so Matt and the seven other people he was with, which included the two trip leaders from the Sierra Club, they would stay at this temporary base camp for the next couple of days, going over their hiking routes and talking about emergency procedures and protocols. And then after those two days were up, the group felt like they were ready. And so the group packed up all their things and they boarded the tiny float plane out on the water that would take them to their final destination, this new Canadian national park, better known as the Torngat Mountains. 45 minutes later, the pilot of the float plane began to descend through the clouds to make their landing on a little water inlet. And as the pilot did that, Matt and the seven others were able to look out the window and actually see the Torngat Mountains for the first time. Now, all of them had seen dozens and dozens of pictures of this area, but seeing it for the first time in person was still shocking. The area looks like an alien planet. The wilderness in and around the Torngats is not the same kind of wilderness we think of when we think about going hiking in the forest or going camping or something. No, the wilderness in the Torngats is primordial. It's like you're looking out at a place from the very beginning of time, like dinosaurs should be walking around this area. As far as Matt could see, in any direction were these huge, jagged mountains that had been carved out of the earth by glaciers hundreds of thousands of years ago. And those same glaciers had created hundreds of waterways between the mountains called fjords that almost looked like blue-veined fingers. And even from high up in the plain, Matt could look down and the water of these fjords were so clear that he could see these speckled backs of brown trout swimming beneath the surface. But while this landscape was undoubtedly spectacularly beautiful and pristine and totally incredible, 
It was equal parts unwelcoming to people. There are no roads in the Torngats, there's no campsites, there's no facilities, there's no internet, there's no cell phone, and the weather is unbelievably harsh. It's freezing cold and wet most of the time, and then even when it's a little bit warm and a little bit nice there, the weather can change in an instant and become freezing cold and wet all over again. And so, as such, the handful of visitors that go into this area every year are expected to be 100% self-reliant, because this really is one of the most dangerous wild regions in the world. But for Matt, as he looked out his window and surveyed this landscape, he wasn't second guessing his decision to go into this hostile environment, no. I mean, the reason he was willing to fork over all that money to go on this trip is because he really wanted to experience extreme wilderness firsthand. And so finally, the pilot of the float plane came into land on this little water inlet, and then the pilot ferried the craft over to this beach, and then Matt and the seven others piled off onto land with all of their things, and then as the pilot turned around and left, the two Sierra Club trip leaders, a 61-year-old man named Rich Gross and a 60-year-old woman named Marta Chase, told the group to pick up their things and follow them. And so Rich and Marta led the hikers about 500 feet away from where they had just been dropped off up to this slightly elevated, mostly flat area that kind of overlooked the fjord and had this incredible view of all the mountains around them. Now, unlike the temporary base camp they had been at for the past couple of days, this camp was nowhere near any forests. They were basically on a wide open plain that kind of went right up into these mountains. So it's very wide open where they're staying. And so after Rich and Marta instructed the group where to set up their tents, Matt and the others got to doing that, and then after they were all set up, Rich and Marta put a small electric fence around the perimeter of their tents to keep any nosy animals out, and then the group headed up a little bit higher on this mountain near them to take their first group photo. And in this photo, they all look so happy and so excited for what's to come. And over the next couple of days, their trip would go exactly to plan. During the daytime hours, they would hike all of their pre-planned hiking routes all over the mountains and down near the water. And at night, they would eat their food and drink fresh water from the fjord and swap stories from back home. But their perfect trip was about to become a nightmare. In the early evening hours of Tuesday, July 23rd, so two days after the group arrived in the Torngat Mountains, Matt and the others returned from one of their hikes. Now, the day had been cold and rainy, but the group was in good spirits. This was their last day at this particular camping spot. The next morning, they were going to pack up and head farther inland to their next camping spot. After Matt and the others had put their gear back inside of their tents, they came back out to see that Rich and Marta, the two trip leads, had organized a special feast for the group to celebrate the successful beginning of their trip. And so the group all sat around eating salami and crackers and drinking rum mixed with lemonade as they talked excitedly about the next couple of days and what they could expect. At some point during the festivities, Matt was tired and so he broke away from the group. He climbed back inside of his tent, got inside of his sleeping bag, and before long, he was fast asleep. A few hours later, around 3.30 in the morning, Matt suddenly woke up. He had no idea what had woken him up, and so for a second, he just lay there listening to the outside world and just kind of staring straight up. Now, the moon was out that night, so there was some illumination, and as he looked straight up at the underside of his tent, he sees this huge figure move across the side of his tent and then stop right on top of him. And then before Matt's brain could process what was happening, this huge figure began pressing down on the fabric of Matt's tent. And so he's seeing his tent collapsing in on him. Matt's not doing anything. He's not saying anything. He's just watching in horror. And then suddenly the tent rips open and these two arms reach into the tent and they grab at Matt. And Matt threw his hands up in defense and screamed out for help. And as he did that, he suddenly felt this vice-like grip on the top of his head, and then before long, he was being pulled out of the hole in his tent, out into the night. And as Matt is being dragged along on the ground, having no idea what's going on, he can't move. All he can hear is this crunching sound, which he would later find out was the sound of his skull and jaw breaking. And he started to smell this horrible, rotten fish smell. And then he felt what felt like saliva coming over his face. And then Matt began kind of trying to look around because he couldn't really move his head. 
and he noticed all he could see was white fur. And it was then that Matt realized he was in the jaws of one of the world's most powerful and deadliest predators. Standing 10 feet tall on its hind legs and weighing as much as 1,700 pounds, the North American polar bear sits right on top of the Arctic food chain. And now this apex predator was dragging Matt by the skull down to the beach where Matt knew he would be eaten, even if Matt was still alive when the eating began. When the bear first ripped open Matt's tent and bit down on the top of his skull, Matt let out that scream and it actually woke up the entire camp. And one of the first people to emerge from their tents to see what was going on was one of the trip leaders, Marta. And so she jumps out of her tent and just three feet away from her, she sees this huge polar bear on its hind legs diving into the tent to get after Matt. And so Marta instinctively yells out to Rich to get his flare gun and she dove back into her tent to retrieve her own flare gun. But by the time she and Rich had both emerged gun in hand, this polar bear had already dragged Matt 200 feet away from the camp. And by this point, the other hikers in the group had also emerged from their tents. And after realizing what was going on, they just stood there absolutely paralyzed with shock, staring at this bear, dragging one of their companions down to the beach to be killed. Then after Rich fired his flare gun, generally in the direction of the bear, it kind of snapped the group out of their paralysis. And then moments later, they were all screaming and banging pots and pans to try to terrify the bear into releasing Matt from its jaws. Matt couldn't hear the sounds of his companions calling out to try to save him, nor did Matt feel any pain. He was in shock. The only thing going through Matt's head as he was being dragged along the ground to the beach was, I'm going to die. I'm either going to die on the way to the beach, or when I get there, then when the bear starts eating me, I'm going to die. And when he thought about this, it was with a kind of eerie, calm detachment. Like he wasn't sad or mad. It was just kind of a fact. This was going to happen. But as Matt was kind of making peace with his reality, Rich fired that flare gun shot and that ball of chemical fire exploded basically right in front of the polar bear's face. And the polar bear who was startled by the flare instinctively whipped its head to the side up and then down again, and it didn't let go of Matt. And so Matt was whipped like a rag doll up and then was slammed down into the ground. And when Matt hit the ground, he heard the sound of his neck breaking. But as as Matt was laying there, the bear released him from its jaws, and then behind Matt, the bear turned around and began walking away. And so Matt could hear the sound of its big paws moving away from him, and suddenly Matt's thinking, oh my god, I might survive this. And so he tried to lay as still as he possibly could so as not to attract any attention, and he began repeating in his head over and over and over again, please bear, go away, please bear, go away. But as if out of a horror movie, as Matt is laying there repeating this phrase, he hears the sound of this bear stopping, turning around, and start moving back towards him. And so Matt's just thinking, okay, it's going to come back over here, it's going to bite my head, and that's the end. But luckily, Rich, by this point, one of the trip leads, had run down closer to the beach, reloaded his flare gun, and right as this bear was going to bite Matt again, Rich had fired that flare, and once again, the chemical fire had kind of exploded right near the bear, causing it to get startled, it turned around, it ran off, and this time the bear did not return. It would turn out Rich and Marta, the two trip leaders from the Sierra Club, had chosen a location for this campsite that was so heavily trafficked by polar bears, it was referred to as a polar bear highway. When all of the hikers, which included Marta and Rich, had been given their safety brief when they were staying in those plywood structures at that base camp near the runway, well, part of the brief was whenever you make camp in the Torngots, you want to be at least a quarter mile away from water. Go way inland because the polar bears hunt and fish and walk around right along the edge of these fjords. But despite all seven members of this Sierra Club expedition being experienced wilderness backpackers, 
none of them really appreciated just how dangerous it was to be camping or even hiking around in known polar bear territory. And so this is why they ultimately ignored the safety brief and set up their first camp just a couple hundred feet away from the water's edge. And even prior to the attack on Matt, when the group literally saw polar bears wandering around near their camp and even at one point had to fire their flare guns at the polar bears to get them to leave, the group still decided it was best to stay at this particular campsite. Perhaps they believed their electric fence they had set up around the perimeter of their tents would protect them from these polar bears, but obviously that had not been the case. The bear that attacked Matt had been totally unaffected by their fence. Matt would survive this attack, but really only because one of the members of the expedition happened to be a medical doctor, and so they were able to stabilize Matt until help arrived. Matt's injuries were extensive. They included a broken skull, a broken jaw. He had slash marks and puncture wounds all over his head and his neck, and all of those wounds got horribly infected. And also his voice was permanently changed as well because the bear also slashed his vocal cords. Following the attack on Matt, Parks Canada, which is the agency that oversees all of Canada's national parks, including Torngots, has mandated that any organization going into Torngots National Park has to have a polar bear protection plan in place. As for Matt, he does not make a big deal about his near-death experience. In fact, he kind of makes light of it and sometimes even makes jokes about it. As for the polar bear that attacked him, Matt holds no ill will. If anything, the attack has made him more interested and appreciative of the apex predator. In August of 2014, so 11 months after Matt's brush with death, he returned to the Torngots and even visited the actual site of the attack, perhaps to get closure. Except this time, he was in the company of an armed polar bear expert. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the like button asks you to get them cereal, say yes, and then go to the store and buy the huge single biscuit shredded wheat cereal. On October 4th, 2017, a 61-year-old father of six named Tatike Kotsai arrived at a hospital in Stellenbosch, which is one of the richest towns in South Africa. Tatike, who lived in the area with his family, had been dealing with some stomach issues over the last several months, and so this day he was finally going in to have abdominal surgery to hopefully alleviate those issues. So, after entering the building, Tatike was checked in, and then before long he was transferred to the operating room, where surgeons got to work on him. After the surgery was over, Tatike was transferred to a recovery room in the hospital, where he was scheduled to stay for at least a couple of days, so the doctors and nurses could watch over him while he recovered and make sure there was no complications from the procedure. And so, on the afternoon of October 4th, Tatike just kind of lounged around inside of his recovery room. He couldn't really do anything because of the incision on his stomach, and so he mostly just laid in his bed, he watched TV, he relaxed, he ate, and then at some point, some of his family members came into the hospital and they visited with him as well. By the end of that day, the day of his surgery, Tatike was definitely sore from the incisions, but overall, he was in good spirits, and to the medical staff, it seemed very likely that his surgery was a success. Early the next morning, at around 5.15 a.m., one of the nurses in the hospital went to Tatike's room to check on him. And when she went inside, Tatike was awake, he was alert, he seemed totally normal. And so after a brief conversation, the nurse told Tatike that she was just going to get him some fresh linens to make up his bed. And so Tatike nodded a thank you to her. And then the nurse, she turned away from Tatike, who's in his bed. She stepped out of the one door in the room into the hallway. She grabbed fresh linens off of a cart, and then she turned back around and went back into Tatike's room, except now Tatike was not in his bed. So the nurse immediately thought, okay, well then Tatike must have gone into his bathroom because the door was shut, he must be in the bathroom. And so, just kind of reflexively, the nurse walked over to Tatike's now empty bed and replaced the linens, and then when she was done, she just looked at the bathroom door inside of his room, expecting Tatike to come outside any minute. But after a couple of minutes passed and Tatike had still not come out of the bathroom, the nurse decided to go over and just knock. And so she walked over, she knocked on the bathroom door and just kind of called out, hey, is everything okay in there? 
but there was no answer. And so the nurse eventually just tried the handle. And when she saw it was open, she called out that she was coming inside. She opened up the bathroom door and it was empty. And so the nurse, she whipped her head around and looked back out at the room where Tatike should have been. And she saw, you know, he's not on the bed. He's not under the bed. He's not anywhere in this room. Where could he have possibly gone? And she's thinking to herself, the only door out of this room is into the hallway, the same door that she had used to go out and get the linens. And if somehow Tatike had ran out of that door in the few seconds that her back was turned from Tatike, she certainly would have heard him or seen him. Because again, she was right outside the door and only outside of his room for a couple of seconds. Not to mention the fact, Tatike has major incisions on his stomach and could barely stand, let alone walk or run. And so totally baffled, this nurse ultimately left the room and went and told her superiors. This hospital would immediately begin looking for Tatike on the grounds of the hospital, but they would do it kind of quietly. They wouldn't call Tatike's family to tell them that, hey, we can't find him, nor would they call police. And some have speculated that either one, the hospital did not think this was an emergency and they would quickly find Tatike and that everything would be fine, or two, the hospital was just so embarrassed at the idea that they lost a patient, they didn't want anyone to know. And so that's why they didn't tell anyone. Regardless, the hospital would search for Tatike all day on the 5th, the day he went missing, and they wouldn't find him. And then the next day, the 6th, the hospital again would spend the entire day quietly searching everywhere in the hospital, but they wouldn't find him again. And so finally on the next day, the 7th, so 48 hours after Tatike had just kind of vanished inside of his room, the hospital would reach out to Tatike's family and they would say to them, Hey, uh, is Tatike home with you guys? And the family was like, no, he's supposed to be with you. And so the hospital would say, well, you know, he left two days ago, so we don't know where he is. And so Tatike's family is horrified, not only that they were totally left in the dark, but they would find out over the course of this conversation that the hospital had not even contacted the police yet. And so the family, they reached out to the police, and then later that day, the family would meet the police at the Stellenbosch Hospital, and then a very public search of the property would ensue to look for Tatike. However, again, no one could find him. Authorities would continue to search both the hospital and also the neighboring area outside of the hospital over the next couple of days. But after they continued to find absolutely nothing, the search began to wind down. And so Tatike's devastated family was left with absolutely no idea what to think or what to do. Fast forward to October 20th, so 15 days after Tatike had gone missing. And on this day, the 20th, there was a construction crew at this hospital in Stellenbosch doing some renovations. And at some point on this day, one of the workers had to climb into the ceiling of one of the floors of this hospital. Now, the space above the ceiling is this tight, cramped space, almost like an attic. It's very big and wide. It's like the whole length of that floor. And really the only people that would ever go into the ceiling are construction workers or other authorized personnel that needed to do work. It's not a place that the public would ever go into. But when one of these workers went up into the ceiling, he had a headlamp on and he's kind of looking around. He's looking for what he needs to do up there. And at some point he turns his head and his light illuminates a person sitting in the corner far away from him, way up against the side in this tiny little attic space. And it would turn out it was Tatike and he was deceased. The hospital had absolutely no clue how Tatike could have gotten up there. Not only is it obviously not a publicly accessible area, but the actual way to get up into the ceiling, the door that leads up into the ceiling, is very difficult to find. And even if Tatike found this entrance into the ceiling, it would have been nearly impossible for him to actually get into the ceiling. Because again, this guy has serious incisions on his stomach from the surgery he got. He could barely barely sit up, he couldn't really walk, so the idea of him climbing and pulling himself up into the ceiling just seems impossible. Then there was the very strange autopsy results. Now the full report has not been made public, but Tatike's family had a consultation with the hospital after the autopsy was complete, and they would go to reporters and talk about what the hospital told them. And apparently the hospital told the family that Tatike did not die from complications from his surgery 
and they heavily insinuated that Tatike did not die from natural causes. Something happened to him, and the hospital had no idea what this something was, and that's what killed him. And the hospital also told the family that Tatike likely was dead before he went up into the ceiling. Meaning, someone or something killed Tatike, and then someone or something placed him in the ceiling. Again, this is just from the family going to reporters and talking about their discussion with the hospital. The hospital's only official statement has basically been that they have cooperated with the family and they don't really know what happened to Tatike. Now, of course, this is a very strange story, but it gets even weirder. On May 10th, 2019, so about a year and a half after Tatike was found deceased in the Stellenbosch Hospital ceiling, a 53-year-old father of four named Sandil Sabia arrived at another hospital in South Africa. It was in a city called Durban, which is considered to be one of the nicest and wealthiest places in South Africa, similar to Stellenbosch. Sandil was a builder, and he had been working on a house when he had fallen and broken his leg. Specifically, he broke his femur bone the bone that runs from your hip down to your knee, the big single bone in your thigh. So just for reference, if you break your femur, you can't walk. So with some assistance from friends and family, Sandil hobbled his way into this hospital in Durban and he began to receive care. Two days later, on May 17th, Sandil was still in the hospital, still recovering from this broken femur, when his cousin came to visit him. The cousin said Sandil seemed totally normal, and that during this visit, Sandil told the cousin that after the cousin left, Sandil was going to be transported from this hospital to another hospital nearby, where he was going to get an x-ray of his leg, as well as talk to another orthopedic surgeon. But apparently, after this cousin left from this visit, the doctors at the Durban hospital walked into Sandil's room to take him and transport him to this other hospital, and Sandil was not in his room. Now, this hospital in Durban was known for their very tight security, and so right away, their reaction was very different than the Stellenbosch hospital's reaction. This hospital immediately contacted authorities and said, we are missing a patient, and they began a very public search of their hospital for Sandil. But they couldn't find him. On May 18th, so six days after Sandil disappeared, the hospital in Durban began to smell this horrible stench coming from one wing of their hospital. And so hospital workers would track the stench to a janitor's closet, and when they opened it up, they saw this black liquid dripping out of the ceiling, and the liquid was coming from Sandil's decomposing body that was located in the ceiling. Sandil's autopsy would be carried out very quickly. However, the results of that autopsy have never been made public, and Sandil's family has not commented on the results of this autopsy. As of today, all we know is that within a two-year period, two seemingly ordinary South African men, who both could either not walk at all or who could barely walk because of their physical injuries, somehow snuck out of their hospital rooms totally undetected by staff and then wound up dead in the hospital scene. Ceiling. Some say the men really did somehow sneak out of their own accord and decided to go into the ceiling, and that's what happened. Others say both men were murdered and then placed into the ceiling, and still others think these two cases are the best examples of something called spontaneous teleportation, which is the hypothetical phenomenon where a human suddenly disappears and then almost instantaneously reappears in another location. But for now, there is no official explanation, so those are all just theories. And so it's up to you to decide what you believe. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's story and you haven't done this already, please put coyote urine in the like buttons apple juice.